Welcome to a new breed of golf live. Michael Breed here. Excited to be uh, helping you again from the Morgan Franklin Transformation Center. And, and of course, um, you know how much we love being able to help you play good golf and, and uh, get you to understand some of the, the nuances of the, of the swing. And one of the really important things uh, to understand is how to deliver a square club face on the path intended. Those are things that, that um, well, I, I would say simply put, with repetition, you can get better at it. But there are a couple of things that really can destroy that. And one of the things that can destroy that is this early extension, which is what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to come at it from a slightly different angle. Uh, so if, if you think you've seen some of this, you might see it through a little different light and certainly something that's going to help you at least get an understanding of, of how to do this better. Before we get to all that, a couple little housekeeping things I got to tell you about. You know, when I reach into the back pocket, you know what I'm going for. It's the blessed poker chip ball marker. There it is right there. Guaranteed for birdies, pars, bogeys. There's no triple bogeys in this thing. None. Very simple for you to get. Just send an email to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. They've been very, very popular. We've had to reorder several times and we've got plenty for you. So if you're interested, send that email to me and we will get those to you. Also too, by the way, we have uh, the let's do this putter covers. So I've got for the mallet and that's the mallet and for the blade, this one here, just like that. I've actually, I've signed these poker, I mean, these poker chips, these, these uh, putter covers, sign them both there and there. They're not going to, it's not like it's going to run on your hand or anything. It's actually sewn into that. So we've got those. If you're interested in those, please uh, make sure that you, that you reach out. And then also two, I would be remiss if I did not tell you about our hats. And there it is right there. In fact, there's a part of me that wants to put that thing on. But then I'm thinking there's a part of me that wants to make sure that you get it. So if you are interested, we've got them in a bunch of different colors, blue, white, red, tan. Send an email to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. We had a great, by the way, great interaction today on the radio show on Sirius XM. If you didn't get a chance to, uh, to join us there, we were giving away some golf balls as we do every Thursday. And thanks to our friends at Titleist, we were able to do that. But we had a phenomenal um, outpouring of, of emails from uh, many of you. So thank you for that and continue to do so. Share your thoughts. And we tell you all the time, every week, if there's something that you want to talk about, please let us know. This thing about early extension comes from emails that we have gotten. And so we go right to it. If there's something that you're not sure of, how do, you, how do we start the backswing? How do we start the downswing? What about a release? Whatever it is, send an email to me at a new to golf at michaelbreed.com. We'll get that. We'll bring you up on the show and obviously uh, get to helping you with, with understanding the challenge of whatever it is that you're battling. Now, before we get to this early extension thought, I want to show you the guys behind the scenes. And this is always one of my favorite parts during the week, Greg Ducharme. And of course, Gibbs, hey, oh, whoa. Oh, there's a little grasp there going on. Now, like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's impossible date could be, but well done. I like that. Um, all right. So what is early extension and how does it like, how does it destroy, uh, the golf, the, the, the golf swing? How does it destroy it? Well, let me get a little down the line. Um, look here. There you go, Gibbsy. So early extension is when the, the hips move underneath the shoulders and in line with the feet. And it's one of those things that when you start to do this, you don't get uh, the hips to rotate. You don't get the upper body to rotate. Most early extenders will tend to be facing the golf ball at the strike. So you come in here like this, you early extend, you're facing the golf ball, not facing the target, but you're facing the golf ball. And as a result, what ends up happening to you is um, you throw the club off of a path, right? So for instance, we go back down that line again. Uh, common thought wisdom would be that this club is going to come into the ball, depending upon the club itself, slightly from the inside somewhere, go down the line, strike the, the uh, golf ball in the center of the face, and then go through slightly to the, to the inside as well. What we don't want to have happen is we don't want to have a lot of flashing of the club face, and we don't want to have a lot of flashing of the path. Well, what happens when we start to come down into this and we early extend, lower body starts to come out this way, the club will tend to drop down here. And now 
when this club is going out that way, I want to hit the ball into the screen, but my club is on this path here. Well, if it's on that path there, logic would say it's going to go over in that direction there. And that's not where the target is. Target's over there. So now how am I going to get that golf ball back from that start point? Well, I have to take the face and I got to rotate it. Well, it's really difficult to rotate this club face, particularly with faster clubs like a driver or something like that, consistently. You might be able to do it once or twice in 18 holes, but you're not going to be able to do it on the first tee shot, then the approach shot, then the next tee shot, then the approach. It's really difficult to do. So what I will tell you is, is that when you maintain what we call hip depth and you maintain the spine angle, now the club is going to come down here in a very fairly consistent path. So I'm here and I keep that angle and you can see that golf ball. And, and this is the important thing to, to understand about this. That golf ball more or less started at the target. Okay, I don't know, Greg, if you can if you can put a uh, trace on that, but it more or less started at the target. Now, what it didn't do was start way off to right field. There you go, great shot. So that started right at the target. It didn't start at the fifty yard basket or bucket that's on the left hand side, or the fifty yard bucket that's on the or barrel on the right hand side. And so what I got was I got a shot that might not have been my best shot that I've ever hit. But that's certainly an easy shot to chase. In other words, that shot there is going to be around the green. Maybe it's a little bit in the front. Maybe it's a little bit to the right, but it's around the green. And the strike was very solid. The other thing that happens to you, speaking of strike, is you start dealing with low points. And when the, when the body is working underneath this way and the club comes under here, the low point is going to now happen Go to a face on here, gives you if you would. The low point's going to happen feet behind the ball. Well, if you're getting this to go, you can hear two noises here. Try to try to listen to this again. So you hear the ground get hit and then the ball get hit. Now, in a mat, I'll get two strikes. If I'm outside in the grass, it might get stuck in the grass and I might take the grass and flop it over the golf ball, but it could be that bad. The other thing is, is that if you miss this ground here, you could actually swing right above the ball. I've seen that happen. And so what happens is there's nothing, there's nothing very good that's going to come from early extension. It's a, it's a, it's a simple thing to do. The other thing that happens is this, and this is the final thing before I get into showing you how you're going to get out of this. When I have early extenders, I have tremendous amount of face rotation, shaft spinning, because the only way to get the club through the ball is to do it with arms and hands. So imagine if you were sitting on a, on a bar stool and you swung this way, you'd have to have what I would call a short arm in the follow through and a short arm in the backswing. So the trail arm in the backswing is short and the trail arm in the follow through is short. Anytime you're getting short and short, that means your body isn't doing much and your arms and hands are doing the majority of uh, the carrying of the club through the strike. Okay. So this is going to look like this. Body is kind of done, not doing much and arms and hands have to get active. And now many people go, well, I got to get my body more active. And so what they do is they start taking the hips and sliding them forward. And you're in here like this. So if I make a backswing and I slide forward, I've done nothing to carry the club down to the golf ball. So what do I have to do? I got to move my arms and my hands to get the club down to the golf ball. That's what I have to do. And so what you have to realize is, is that early extension also means no body rotation. I don't see people that early extend that, that rotate the body, specifically the hips. I don't. What I also see is I see a lot of swings that run out of speed when the club gets um, sort of parallel to the ground in the follow through. They kind of shut down. The swing shuts down. And what that means is, is that your lower body is typically riding underneath your upper body. And when the lower body is riding underneath the upper body, it's basically a braking system for the, for the body. You are 
hitting the brakes on the body. And now all of a sudden, your arms and hands have to get active there. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to feel like your hips are staying back. So away from the shoulders. So the show, so imagine there's a line here. My hips are on this side of the line. My shoulders are on this side of the line and throughout the golf swing, my shoulders are going to stay on this side of the line and my hips are going to stay on this side of the line. Now it doesn't work like that, but that's what you want to image. So you get set up here like this. You go, okay, my shoulders are going to be on that side of my toes and my hips are going to be on that side of my toes. So in here like this, in here like that. And now all of a sudden what you're going to see is my golf ball is relatively straight. It's around the target. Hang on that shot for a second, Gibbsy. And what you can see is the trace of that shot is more or less at the target. And the reason why is in the downswing, when my hips are back and my shoulders are forward, the club is coming down like this. So simple image is, and I'll use a gear tie here. This thing is sitting right here like this. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna build, I'm gonna build something here. Let me just build something here. So this will take a second. So I'll take, I'll take this, and then I'll take that. And then I'm gonna take this. And then I'm gonna put this like this. Okay, so imagine in the down the line view, Gibbsy. Imagine that that's here. So right here, my shoulders are on that side of this, and right here, my hips are on the back side of that. And what you want to do is, when you make your backswing, feel like your shoulders are all over here, and your hips are still over here. And then when you come through, your shoulders are all over here, and your hips are all over there. So if you go here and there. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to have the hip depth that you want, and you're going to be able to bring the club down and strike the ball solidly. So I have that image in my mind. I'm in here like this. Boom, boom. Club face was a little open on that one, but still a very, very good, clean strike. And what also happened for me was I hit the ball first. One of the most important things that you can do for predictable distance is hit the ball first. You hit the ground first problem hit the ball first you got a chance so same thing here shoulders are over there hips are right there and now what you can see is shot relatively around the target that ball speed on that one is about 115 miles an hour so very very clean strike very similar to what i'm getting um in in normal course of play and the predictability of it and i'm not even thinking about just just trying to get you to image that. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm now going to show you this little trick. Now, this here is, I'm going to say this is a five-foot gear tie, okay? And you know how I feel about these gear ties. So what you're going to do, this is how you're going to teach yourself how to control the body properly. What you're going to do is you're going to take this gear tie, and you're going to set it up like this, okay? Now, we're going to do a little twisting. Somebody whistle. Do, do, do. Okay? So now we go like that. Twist that there like that, okay? Now, I'm going to take just a very sort of small swim noodle. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to put that on there. Wrap that and wrap that. Okay, so now go face on if you would, Gibbsy. So there you go. So this is this is roughly where my right hip would be, trail hip. Now go down the line. And there you go. And it's right off of the side of the body. Now, when I come through, if I early extend, body hasn't rotated, this here is pointing still back to camera one. What I want to do is I want to rotate so that this is now pointing over to camera two, which is the face on camera. And what you can see is, is that when I come through here and I do that, you can see now that this is a little bit lower. This is a little lower 
than this. You can see the gear tie is on a slight angle. So I'm here and then I'm there. If I early extend, I'm like this and now they're pretty level. Here, they're pretty down. So one of the, the images that I want you to have is the following. When you come through into the strike, I want you to take your right hip, your trail hip, and I want you to point it to the golf ball or where the golf ball would be. So let me take that right there. And what I want you to image is we're going to take a light. So there's a light sticking out of here. So here's the light sticking out of there like that. And I'm going to point that light right down to there. Now, it's not going to point directly to that, but you can see it's pointing down. This pointing up, this pointing down. And when I point that down, what you're going to notice is my left hip now goes back that way. So when I go like this, my left hip is here. So I'll put that golf club right there. You can see it. And then when I point down, that golf club disappears. So the idea is your trail hip is going to point down to the ground as you come through that strike. Now I got to fold this up. Don't want to hurt myself. And what I'm going to do is all I'm thinking about is pointing that thing to there before I get the strike. And now what I get is I get a really good strike, this one directly at the target. Now let me do a little videotape in here for us. So we'll go over here, and then we're going to go over here, and then I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. So same exact thing. I'm taking that flashlight or this swim noodle, and I'm pointing it down to that. Okay. Now, I want you to watch what happens as we take this. Now, watch the swim noodle. Watch this thing right here. Okay. So, this is starting to come down. Now, it is. And this is the fun part. It is not pointing at the golf ball. But I'm trying to get that feeling that it's pointing at the golf ball. And what you can see is, is that here is the, is the gear tie. And it's probably, like, it's probably like that. If I go from where it is up there to where it is there. And you can see that's pointing down. Now, I want you to watch something really cool about this. Because this is, this is probably the most important uh message that i can deliver to you here my lead hip right there is at that spot there so now i have impact now i go to address and you can see that my starting point is here and then when i get to impact it's back there so what's happened is is that by using this thought what i've done is i've actually taken my hips and driven them either even farther back they, than they originally were now that seems kind of cool who does that i knew you were going to ask that question so this guy does that you know who this guy is so that's right there and that's right there see it again so his, his rear is right up against that yellow line. When I go like that, now all of a sudden, it goes farther back. Now, is that what he's thinking about? I don't think so. Never talked to him about it. I never asked him what he thinks about to do this. But what I can tell you is, is that this is one of the best golf swings, 2000, 2001, that we've ever seen in the game. It's the most functional effective golf swing we've seen in the game my opinion okay now i want to show you um and this is going to take me a second to get this but i'm going to show you a golf swing of a guy who is a very very good player 
has been out there for a long time, has, uh, let's see, he's got a major championship to his credit. And um, he also has a players. And that's this guy, Webb Simpson. And I, I've said this many times. I've known Webb for a long time. I've known his coach, Ted Kegel, for a long, long time. But I want you to watch this. So that's how he sets up. Now, this is what happened. And I don't know if the ball is going to move here. So I'm going to put a, a little mark on the golf ball. And there he goes. So the ball moves a little bit. But look at how his rear has come off of the line. Now, if you compare that guy to this guy and you look at that impact position versus this impact position there's a couple of things that are noticeable one of them is you can't really see webb's left butt cheek but you can see that with with uh tiger so you can see right here how much he is rotated out of the way the other thing is look at how much of his left leg you can see right here you can't now again i know camera angles i get it I, I i understand but you can't see any part of his left leg why because his lower body hasn't rotated and when the lower body doesn't rotate you're never going to get a look at the back leg so let's go to a camera uh, angle that camera one gibbsy when i get set here if i don't rotate you can't see my left leg if i rotate like this now all of a sudden you can see my left leg so as I start to take my trail hip and point it down there like that, now you can see the, the trail leg. So we go like this. Set up. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the ball with my right hip, my trail hip, pointing down to that. So here. And now what I get is I get a very, very clean strike at really good speed on this one. This one went a, a healthy distance. And go to the, uh, the hub there, or the sim, right? And you can see that golf ball had a little fade, which is what I like to do. It had a little fade and ended up right at my target. So there's a lot to like about that. So... To understand how to improve your ball striking, you have to understand the value of working on your hip depth, the value of working on um, making sure that you don't come out of that or early extend. A lot of people say, well, I come out of my, yeah, because you're backing away from it. Your, your chest is backing away from the golf ball. I want you to fall into that golf ball. We go back to um, Tiger. So let's go over here to Tiger. And in fact, you know what? Let's do this a little differently. So if I draw a line on Tiger's head, when he goes to the strike, his head is dropped here. I go back to there. Here's his face here. There's his face there. So it's gotten lower. Now let's go to Webb. So here's Webb. At address here and at impact, yeah, it's gone down, but not like Tigers has gone down. But what I want you to also see is, and this is why I drew on the face here's the face, and there's his face there. So, what has it done? It's backed away from the golf ball, which is why at impact, if I go neck to hip, that's the angle that his back is at, and if I go to address it started sort of neck to hip there so it started there and then it shifted to there and the and the and the camera moved a little bit okay so you need to appreciate the importance of this and i would say this is probably one of the top most important in swing um responsibilities that you have to proper ball striking is make sure that your hips have depth make sure the trail hip is pointing down to the ground so here and then the same thing there and what you're going to feel is is an, an enormous amount of speed 
in the hips. You're going to feel a, a lot of speed coming out of that. This is one of the things that you're going to see from home run hitters. This is one of the things that you're going to see from tennis players when they're hitting that, that ball. They're, they're playing square like this, and then they boom, and the hips are just spinning out as you go. Got to make sure that you, you think about this. I'm teaching my son how to hit a baseball, and it's the same thing. You're going to stride, and then your hips are going to go. And you got to feel like you're going to hit that ball with your trail hip. Let's do this one more time. Try to hit this one a little farther. Okay, this is, this is what we call peppered. Come on up. Gibbsy, bring, bring four up here for me so we can take a look at this. 124 miles an hour speed. I didn't do anything particularly um, abruptly with my arms and my hands. What I did was I was abrupt. I was fast. I was rotational with the hips. And all I thought about was taking that trail hip and pointing it right down to the to the golf ball there. And all of a sudden, 100-foot apex, all the launches, all the speeds. Look at that, 191 yards of distance on 124 in that ball speed. It's, it's imperative for you to – over here. Sorry, Gibbsy. Um, it's imperative for you to understand that. And I can tell you, you want to improve your bunker play. You want to improve – um, the consistency of your strike, the predictability of your irons, the launch angles, all those other things. You have to control the hips. You have to control the hips and specifically the trail hip. That trail hip, when it comes through, has to be lower than the lead hip. And when that happens, now all of a sudden you start to get that bend. And when you get that bend, that's when you deliver the, the strike that you're looking for. Okay. All right, so now what we're going to do, turn it over to you. You guys get the show for the rest of the show. And Greg Ducharme, take it away, my friend. Okay, um, we got a bunch of questions already. By the way, Joel says, Q is in a weird spot in the alphabet. <laughs> and I agree. <laughs> nice work, Joel. Okay, Michael asks this. Would early extension lead to a chicken wing finish? It, it I, I'm, I'm, um. I'm less apt to say that, you know, A equals B. So I would say it can, it can lead to a chicken wing. What I find is actually lack of rotation leads to a chicken wing. And I know I said there's a, a, um, there's a couple of things that are involved in that, but it's not, it's not all of it. I guess this is the more complicated way of saying that the, the chicken wing is going to come from, and it can come from like Jordan doesn't early extend, but he has a chicken wing. Okay. Chicken wings tend to come from individuals that fear the ball going to the hook side. That's typically what will happen with a chicken wing. Chicken wings will happen from somebody that will early extend. Chicken wings will also happen when somebody doesn't rotate their body. So in other words, if I slide my body and then come in here and hit this, now I'm going to get into a chicken wing. Chicken wing is going to come from somebody that releases the club early. Does that mean that they're going to early extend? Not always. Many times, but not always. But chicken wings, this is what I would say about chicken wing. As a rule, and again, it's not, you know, rules are sort of 98% of the time, right? As a rule, chicken wings are detrimental. There have been players that have played nicely with chicken wings. Lee, Lee Westwood is one of those. Obviously, Jordan Spieth is one of those. There's a number of people that have played nicely um, in their career with a chicken wing. But as a rule, it's not anything that I like to see. And the reason why is because a chicken wing basically means that the arms are fighting one another. That the right hand, the trail hand, is pushing the club this way and the handle is now working this way. And because my left hand's holding on to the top of this, this thing has to go, well, I got to go like that. Now, that's typically what happens. Not all the time, but typically what happens. So when you get into here and you go like this, you basically stop this, which stops this. But I got to carry it through. And now all of a sudden, I'm in a, I'm in a chicken wing. 
And what I like to see is, I just like to see a little rotation. Now, there are people who can rotate and still have their rear not have the depth that uh, I would prefer. So you can get a little rotation, but the rotation, instead of the rotation going back like this, where the lead hip goes back, it goes, it almost goes like that where the lead hip is moving out and you'll feel weight distribution get out onto the toes. That can happen many times, okay? So what I would say is, is that it is mostly a lack of rotation coming out of that and not always an early extension, okay? All right, here we go. All right, this one from Alan. Um, Alan says, great show, Michael. When is the actual release of the club? Is it at the ball or just after? Oh boy, this is, this is fun. So, um, yes. And yes, this is the easy way to say it. A release is actually gradually happening all through the downswing. So if I go over to this, and then I go to this, and then I go to here. So I've got an angle here that's about a 90 degree angle that we've got here, okay? Now, when Tiger starts to come down, this angle that's right here has gradually, this is a little bit bigger. This one right here is a little bit bigger than this one up here. Not a lot, but a little bit. So it's gradually happening. And then right here, this angle here, and this angle here, that's a little bit bigger. And then right here, this angle here, and this angle here, it's gradually. And then right here, this angle here, and this angle here. So when you start to look at that, you go, wow, this angle has changed from about a 90 degree angle to about a hundred and I don't know, 50 or 60 degree angle, and he's not even quite at the ball yet, and then he hits it. Now, what also happens is there's a little bit of an illusion because the club and the body are working in a rotational fashion. But the simple way to say it is this. And, and this, there's no simple way to say this, but this is the simplest way to say it. Is at address in the down the line view, I have an angle that's here. This angle, I'm just going to say is 135, okay? I make a backswing, and now it gets up here and it gets to 90. If I come back to a 90-degree angle right here, the toe of the club will be in the air, my hands will be straight down, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up in a hospital, okay? So it starts out at 135. You can go face on here, Gibbsy. It starts out at 135 it changes to 90 and then it's gradually going from 90 to, and this is the hard part, the simple, but the hard part, somewhere between 90 doesn't happen somewhere between, I'm going to say 135 and uh, like web it's, it might even be 180, right? So if I go, if I go back over here to, um, where was I with Webb right here? So Weber has an angle of this to this. So that's 135. And then when Webb gets to impact, this angle now has gone. It's not, it's not dead straight, but it's close, but that angle has changed. So now you get into this part and this is the hard part. What does release mean? So release is, and this would be a, a, a down the line, Gibbers, a release for some is this. So when I take this angle and it goes to there, that's a release. For some in the face on, some the release is this. So there's a rotational release. And that rotational release is a release for getting the club face. Now, what do I try to teach? 
I try to teach, if I'm talking about releases with uh, wrists and arms and the club, I don't want to see rotational release. I want to see centrifugal force release. Centrifugal force is the um, centrifugal or the pull of the head of the club away from center to, to lengthen the arm. That's what it is. And what I want when you come through is I want that. I want that length there. So if I go back to Tiger and I do that, and then I go to here, what you can see is look at the length of that arm and look at the length of the club shaft. Now, you can say that his forearms have released. That now is also going down a different, a different line. And, and that will happen with a shot shape. So this release right here is a specific shot shape. And that shot shape doesn't necessarily mean draw or fade, but it can mean high or low. Because if I have a, if I'm going to hit a low shot, I'm not going to hit a low shot like this. I'm going to hit a low shot like this. So I'm going to come into a low shot and my release is going to be held off like that. Body is going this way. And now I hit that shot there. Now, I can't tell you exactly uh, how far that, that shot went. I'll tell you in a second. So it went 161 yards. The apex of that shot was 62 feet. That release is a completely different release than if I'm trying to hit it high. Because when I'm trying to hit it high, now I'm going to go that way, which is going to release up there. It looks like my arms and hands have crossed. But if I take this thing and I point it to you, that toe is directly above the heel. So I haven't shut it like that. I just released up. And it looks like there's a lot of hand activity. There's not. The face hasn't rotated a lot. So if I come in here and I go into vertical release here, which is just a reset, now all of a sudden it chucks the ball up into the air, but it faded. And as we all know with Tiger, Tiger was one of the highest hitters of a golf ball to play. It's one of the reasons why he had such success at Augusta National. So this release, while this appears to you as if there's a lot of forearm rotation in that, that's actually a vertical release there. Nicholas had a vertical release. There are some individuals that that uh, are, are swinging around like this. And they're not letting the hands roll over. They're hitting cuts. John Rahm might be one of those guys. There are other individuals. So releases of forearms and hands and angles and stuff, that can change. But what I can tell you is, is that um, I, I look at the release as the pulling of the head of the golf club away from the shoulder or away from the center, that release there, that's the release that I want to see. And that's sort of a neutral release that doesn't really create a lot of curve. In fact, if it does anything, it's more of a fade release than it is a, a draw release. Okay. All right, Gregory. Okay. This one from Ted. Uh, is this the same as in uh, hips back and shoulders forward? Uh, is this the same setup for short game? Um, yeah, yep. So if I'm going to hit a short shot, I don't want, I don't want my lower body down the line givers. I don't want my lower body moving into the golf ball this way, this way. I want to keep it back because now the bottom of the arc again is right around where the golf ball is. It may be added. It may be a little bit uh, in front of it, but it isn't changing in its low point behind the ball. The other thing is, and this is, it goes back to something that I touched on earlier, is if I'm letting my hips come in this way, not only am I altering the low point, but I'm altering the path. So if I go in here and I go like this, now all of a sudden I'm going to push it out to the right. Okay. So. Simple answer is keep the hips back, rotate the body. You're going to hit a very, very simple chip or pitch shot that's going to have predictability, not just in um, the launch angle, but in the, the, the um, trajectory because the loft that you're going to deliver is going to be consistent. So you're going to have the club on the path that you want. The face won't have rotated. You'll start it on the line that you want. You'll also have predictable 
uh, launch angles, which will give you predictable spin rates and carry distances, which is exactly what you're you're searching for when it comes to uh, short game. Okay. Nice. Okay, All right. Go. This one from Tyler. Uh, good afternoon to the man that never ages. Good afternoon <laughs> to you too. Uh, can <laughs> can poor backswing path attribute to early extension? Can poor backswing path contribute to early extension? Um, can it can, but I would say what's more of a culprit is poor club face position that uh contributes to um early extension and and again going back down the line here if i take the club face back and i rotate the the club face what will end up happening is is that i now have an open club face and if i don't spin the club face closed or get it to square coming down i'm hitting everything what we call sheriff wainwright and so in order for me to spin this i got to slow or stop the the grip cap and when I do that, I got to slower stop my lead arm. And that's going to end up creating that. That's one of the reasons why you see Webb do what Webb does. So if I go back over here to Webb and I watch Webb take the club back, what you're going to see is right at the start, he's going to spin the club face open. Now, the spinning of the club face, just so you know, the spinning of the club face can affect the path. This is why. I, I, I kind of hesitated at the at the start. The spinning of the club face can affect the path depending upon what happens. I can spin the face open and let it go in here, and I can spin the face open and let it go out and away from me. So I can spin it, and I can affect the path as well. But really what I would say is control the face, and then you don't have to worry about it. So when he gets to where he's about parallel to the ground, which is right about there, that club face is really, really open. I'm going to show you something here. And believe it or not, my good friend, Mr. Ducharme, is not even ready for this one. So watch the position of, here's JT. That's JT parallel to the ground. This is Webb parallel to the ground. And look at the difference in their club faces. JT's club face is pointing down to the ground. Webbs is pointing up to the top. Now, they both have an open face at the top, which is fascinating, right? Because you go, wait a second. One guy spun the face. One guy didn't spin the face. Yeah, that's why we're talking about what happens with the early extension. Because what happens with Webb is he's created a bad wrist position. So at the top of his swing... There's Webb's wrist position right there. Okay. Now over to JT, he goes up to the top and there's his wrist position. Now his club face has a little toe hang to it, but it's still kind of leaning in a little bit. So it's open, but it's not nearly open like Webb's. And so what happens here with Webb is now Webb starts to come down. And when he comes down, he he gets a tremendous amount of downset which is what happens when you get that cup like that. You can get a lot of downset because the wrist has a greater range of motion when it's in this dorsiflex position or this cupped position. It gets down like that. And now you can really set that club. The problem is if you take an open face and really set it, you actually set it more open. And so what happens is, is that Webb now has to make up for this downset that he's, that he's created in the downswing. So the club face now is back to this open position right here. Only this time, there's a couple of differences. One, I got to deal with a shot shape. So now I'm trying to figure out how to get this club face square. Two, this thing's going really, 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 really fast. A whole lot faster coming down than going back. And so he has from this spot here to this spot there to figure out how to get this, this club face to get into a closed position which he does a lot. Remember I told you before, guy won a U.S. Open. He won a players. And he won a players. What did he shoot the final day, Greg? 74? 74. Shot 74 the final day. So he had an enormous lead. Why? Because he can do this. Because he's really good. He's a really good athlete. So what he does is he now makes up for that open face. He starts squaring it out. So he starts extending the arm. So this arm right here extends. This hip right here freezes. 
And now he comes down, he hits it. Now, look at this impact position versus that impact position. Two totally different positions there. The foot here on the ground. This one, look at this. This is almost perpendicular to the ground. Look at how much of JT's rear you can see. You can see that yardage book in his left pocket. And by the way, this is a bad angle. This angle is coming in from like, I don't know, maybe uh, 430. This one here is coming in at about, I don't know, maybe 530. It's not dead down the line, but it's close. But look at how different those two positions look right there. Very different. Because the recovery of the face doesn't have to happen for JT. That happens for, for Webb. Now, here's the last thing I want you to notice. Look at the arm here. Versus the arm here. So here, bend. Here, no bend. Because he doesn't have to recover that club face. JT doesn't have to recover the club face. Webb does. And that's why JT hits it a little farther than, than Webb. Not just because he's younger, but that's why he hits it a little farther. Because he has that power right there. Okay? All right. Okay, this one from Corey. Should I be working on my chip shot with just my 56? Or should I be alternating through my uh, alternating with my 60? Because uh, I, I heard you have Lee Trevino on, and he was saying just work on the 56 and then move to the 60. What should I do? Yeah, so what I like to do is to work on technique, I like to take loft out. Okay, so this is a pitching wedge. I'm going to just work on feeling that, that handle stay above the club head. And all of a sudden, when I do that, the launch of that is, is uh, well, you can see it right there. That's 23.3 degrees. Now I figure out, oh, so I don't have to do anything special to get this up into the air. I got to rotate my body. So I do that there. But that's basically the exact same technique that I just did. And now because I have a, a different wedge that's got more loft to it, all of a sudden, I get a different launch angle. That one's at 29.3 in the vertical launch, which is that vertical launch number that I'm looking at is that number right there. So what I will tell you is I, I'm a big believer in, and this was something that was shared to me when I first got into the business. So this is going back to 1985, almost 40 years ago. Gil Cavanaugh, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but was a, a brilliant golf professional and a tremendous individual. His son, Randy, uh, a very, very good golf professional as well. And um, I went and worked for Gil and Gil said to me one day, he said, learn how to chip or pitch with a pitching wedge. That's why they call it a pitching wedge. Learn how to chip or pitch with a pitching wedge and then learn how to do it with a sand wedge. And I think what Lee Trevino shared on the show, which is always awesome to, to hear Lee talking is, hey, you know what, what happens to you many of you is you start trying to affect the loft instead of allow the loft to do what the loft is going to do to affect the ball. So you got to get to a point where you feel like you're hitting it low. This was something Bob Ford said to me at a teaching and coaching summit many, 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 many years ago. I want to say in the early nineties. So call that 30 years ago. And what he said was let the club get the ball in the air with the loft that's on it. That's predetermined by grabbing it out of the bag. And so what I would say is these guys are all really smart, a whole lot smarter than I am. If that's what they say to do, then do it. Start with that pitching wedge. I had a, 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 a coach who worked with me for a long time, Lonnie Knowles, who liked to have people putt, just putt like they were hitting a, a, a chip, just putt like they were hitting a pitch shot and then go from a putter to a, a sand wedge and get the same feeling. Of, we don't try to get the ball in the air with a putter. Why do we try to get it in the air with something that's got way more loft? I mean, logically, just think about it. If you were ever going to try to help something get into the air, it would be with a club that doesn't have any loft. So a putter, you should be doing this. And with a, with a wedge, you should be doing this because you've got all the loft you need on the wedge. So what he would do, brilliant, putt, and then just one putt, and then do the same thing when you hit that, that chip. That's why a lot of people, when they hit short shots, what they'll do is they'll hold the club like a putter, and then they'll just putt and the ball jumps up into the air. Okay. All right. 
this one is from uh, Tidal Wave 1. Michael, what is a good drill to get the feel of your hips turning correctly and uh, a weight transfer versus a slide? Okay. So now we get to we get to build a little bit. So what I like to do is this. I like to put something that is kind of off of the lead leg right there. What I find is, is that people that slide, their knee goes like this. Sliders get into bent knees. Turners get into straight knees. So what I like to do is I like to set this on a slight angle like that. And then what I want to do, great job, Gibbsy. That's fabulous. So what I like to do is I like to get my knee away from that. Now, there's going to be a natural bowing of that knee to get out there. So it, it'll bow out to there and then it'll work away from that. So set up, little space in between there. You can go in the, that's good. So we get in here and we go, and all of a sudden you get that spin. And the spin is from the hips. Come on back. The spin is from the hips doing that, which straightens out the lead leg. Okay, let me hit one more. This is a drill, believe me. I mean, I've done a lot of drills for a long time. This is one that I've done, I can't even tell you how many times, because I used to be a slider, and I had to get out of that. So, And I get into it. I still will fall back into it. So here, there, and now look at this one. I mean, this is tracking my target nicely. And again, what it does is it keeps your... When you start spinning that out that way, let's go down the line. Now, all of a sudden, you can see how deep that lead hip is right there, how far back that is, okay? So that's a really good drill. This is, a, again, a, a reason why I love these things because you can build these all the time. The one thing is you can't find this particular piece at Home Depot. You got to go to Lowe's to get it. They're the only one that, that uh, makes it, so, okay? All right, Gregory. Okay, this one is from Donald. Uh, I love the show. I have, tru I have trouble taking any divot at, at all. Uh, I would like to get better compression with the right divot. Uh, what, can we, what can you do to help? Okay. So th this question is one of my favorite questions that I get because it does relate to early extension, but you have to think about it in a different way. One of the reasons why you don't get a divot is because the club face can get open and then you start gliding it along the ground. The leading edge is just off the ground. So, Gibbsy, if you could, if you come in close to me here with a five, so just jump to a five for me. Yeah, there you go. Now, if I take the club face and I open this thing like this, so I just go like that, spin that club just a little bit like that, what I do is I lift the leading edge off of the ground. And the, in order for me to get a divot, that leading edge has to get into the ground. So... One of the reasons why we have a difficult time creating a divot is you don't have the leading edge low enough and you don't have the leading edge low enough because you don't have your hands far enough forward. So one of my favorite drills here is to do this. We take the club back, set the club parallel to the ground with your thighs in, I mean, your hands in your trail thigh. So right there, great shot. Now from here, what we do is we turn the body this way. So now my hands, you're going to have to show the golf ball here, Gibbsy. My hands are ahead of the golf ball. And then all you're going to do is snap down on the golf ball with your hands. That would be what we would, you would call a release. So you go here, here, there. So here, here, there. And you keep getting used to that snap down. But what you also get used to is what I like to call hand activity. You might call it a release. I like hand activity. So hand activity happening over here is going to take the divot out. Hand activity happening over here is going to put a divot in. So the first thing that I want you to do is I want you to feel hand activity happening over here. So when you get that feel and you go, you actually delay the hand activity. And now all of a sudden you deliver a club that's got less loft on it. And when you deliver a club that's got less loft on it, now the leading edge is into the ground and you take a divot, okay? Now, the second thing that goes on, and again, this is the early extension thing, is your chest. What I like to see with the chest is, and, and this is the cover, you hear this line, covering the ball. So it gives you, if you could, down the line, 
when I get into covering the ball, what I imagine is the only thing that can cover the ball is your chest. So imagine if it's raining. You're standing up here. Rain's coming this way. It's getting the ball wet. If I go like this, now the ball is, is protected. And it's protected by my head and my chest and my neck and all that stuff. Now, I don't want you striking the golf ball with your, with your uh, back perpendicular or parallel to the ground. I don't want that to happen. What I do want you to happen is feel like that. So if I come in here and I feel like my chest is pointing down to the ground, now I'm not going to extend. Now I'm going to actually have a little bit of, of shaft lean in here. And now what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a ball that's going to really pierce out low. That last one launched at 17.6. So now when I take this chest and I point it down to the ground, now what I get is I'm going to get a launch. And this is, a, again, a very good, clean strike. It's going to take a little while for the for the, the numbers to jump up. So let's go up in here. And now what happens is, is that I get a launch of 16.5. So I brought that down a full degree. What also happened was, by the way, that my apex went down to 82. Instead of standing up out of it, if I stand up out of it, which is what many of you do, uh, particularly those that are not taking divots, if I stand up out of this and still try to get a good clean strike, I'm just not going to, I'm going to let my chest kind of rise up here. And now what I'm going to get, look at this, this is going to go, well, I didn't quite hit it solidly enough, but what you should see in this is going to be a higher launch angle. Yeah. So that one there was 16.5 before, and that jumped up to 21 degrees. Now I got a terrible contact which is why my chest is out of it. So I'm not going to get a good one, but my ball launched at 21 degrees instead of 16.5. So I'm going to change the launch by changing the angle of my chest, whether it's covering the ground or covering the ball or not. So if, if I want to, if I want to get a divot, I got to feel like my chest is pointing down to the ground there. Okay. All right, Gregory. Okay. This one from Jeff. Uh, I have a tendency for my upper body to move forward toward the ball during my backswing, which results in an early extension and a loss of balance. Can you help me not move toward the yeah. ball? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is common. Okay. Now, this is a, it's a fun question because this is really one of the things that happens to people and they don't quite understand how to, how to make the body rotate in the backswing. What they do is they take their, so this would be a down the line shot too, gives you, so you probably split screen. If you go here, so here I am here in my address position. You can see that the the uh, green grip over on the, which by the way, this is the grip that uh, Tony Finau plays with, and it's part of the Lampkin part of the Lampkin team. Um, and I I'm going to try to I'm going to try to talk Lampkin into giving a set of these green grips away uh, in the next show that we do. So. Um, I know last week we got a chance to give away some, some grips and next week I'm hoping to give away these green grips here. They're just in the stores now, but it's a phenomenal grip anyway. So the side that this, this grip is on, what's happening is, is that when you're, you, when you're going back and what I want you to do is I want you to pay attention to the grip relative to the screen behind it. So if I make a turn and I rotate this way, you can see how far behind that grip goes from this part right here from this screen. So when I get set up right here and then I put that into that edge of that screen right there, which is right there. If I rotate, you can see that handle move away from the, the screen. Now, if I do this, it go, it just goes down. You see that? So when I take my shoulder and I go down, it looks like I'm turning, but I'm not. I'm just dropping it down. And so if your shoulder is, if, if you feel like you're dropping down and getting closer to the ball, it's because you're not turning properly. So what I like to feel and what I like to teach my students is this. I want to feel like my, my lead shoulder when it's turning is turning higher. Okay. And I could build a, a thing here for you that would give you an idea of what that's about, but you can do this. All you're going to do is you're going to have a, a contraption that's coming. Oh, okay. I hear you. I hear you. So the way this works is this. You take this. We put By the this. way, Jeremy says uh, PVC golf, performance value components. <laughs> yeah. 
that's uh that's fantastic so i'm gonna take this like this then i'm gonna take this like this So I have this thing that's right here. You got to go down the line, Gibbsy. In fact, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it this way. Okay, so that's like that. Now what I want to do is when I get into my address position, I want to feel like my shoulder is going to go away from that. So it's going to go up. And then in the face on view, it's going to go back to it. So you can see right here that this is sort of, I'll call it in the middle of my stance. It's back by my spine. When I turn this, I want to try to get that over there that way. And that shoulder is going to go up high. So I go like this. Now I'll hit one. Let's see if this will work. So I'm going to set this here. And now I'm in this position here. Now what I want to do is I want to feel that happened there you can see how tall i stay there so if you look at my chin or my face relative to something in the in the distance there maybe the bucket what you can see is that when i turn back like this it really doesn't change so i'm here like this and now i get the strike this is going to block the sim from picking up the ball but the point is is that a little contraption like this and there's other ways that you can build this you can make it even uh, even a little bit better than that, okay? But that's something that I would that I would do. The reason why you're dropping down is because you're dropping down, okay? And so what you have to do to not drop down is you have to understand that that shoulder has to move back and up. It won't move up, but it feels like it's moving up. But when it moves back, now we're not moving down, okay? So move it back, and then you'll solve that problem. Okay. Okay, this one from Brian. Uh, after many trips to the Masters and being a walking scorer for uh, for a local Corn Ferry Tour event, I noticed that the players take a very wide stance, well beyond shoulder length, with their fairway woods. I was always taught to be just out uh, just outside shoulder length. So what are your thoughts on this? Okay, so let's just assume, for the sake of argument um that we're gonna go over here because i got my new grip and i i like it so here's the way I, I try to look at the width of a stance as clubs get longer and spines get taller now you have to look at the width of the stance a little bit differently so everybody looks at width of the stance from shoulder to shoulder or hip to hip. So that would look like a, a wide stance there. But as you get longer with the shaft, now all of a sudden the trail hand being lower than the lead hand like this creates a tilt in the spine. Okay. And so what I like to pay attention to when I'm getting set up is when I tilt the spine. Shoulder goes up, my lead hip is going to go forward. So, what I like to do is I like to have enough space in my feet so that my lead hip can go forward and it never goes outside of the lead foot, which means my stance has to get bigger than that. Doesn't look, it's not like that with a wedge. With a wedge, you're kind of, your spine is kind of perpendicular to the ground. But when you get to a longer club, fairway wood driver, whatever, all of a sudden now you got a little tilt. And that means that when you get a little tilt, that hip has to move a little bit more forward. And when that moves a little bit more forward, now we got to get a little bit wider. And so when you get a little bit wider, now all of a sudden it looks like it's really wide. It's not really wide because this shoulder is now going to be outside of this hip. So what I like to do is I look at the lead hip to the trail shoulder as my width. So my width is going to be here. It's outside of the, the trail hip. It's there, it's inside the foot. And my lead hip is here, so it's coming straight down, and that's inside the, the lead foot. So when I create this tilt, now all of a sudden that hip goes forward, trail shoulder goes backward, and now all of a sudden my width of stance is from the trail shoulder to the lead hip. 
And that's what I'm paying attention to. That's the, the width of stance that I'm trying to get. Because when you're making that turn, you got to make sure that all of this is still staying inside here. And when you have a driver in your hand, there's going to be a little bit, uh, Butch used to say, like a half a head of movement, which is what I love to see. In fact, if we go over to this, again, my favorite swing, and you look at Tiger here, and then Tiger goes to, sorry. So Tiger goes like this, and he shifts back. So here's the golf ball here. And when Tiger shifts back, you got to add about, so it's about from here to there. So his head would go from there to about there. So his head moved from, it moved from right there to right there, which is basically about half his head. And I've measured this a lot. So you can see that's, that's, and don't let the hat throw you off. His nose is right there. Okay. So it's about a half a head. You get about a half a head movement um, from the, from the address position to the top of the backswing as you start to get into a little longer club, like a, a driver or a fairway wood. Okay. All right, Greg, we got time for one more question. Okay. Uh, Jerry, this is from Jerry in windy conditions. What would you recommend? Um, when, I'm sorry, in very windy conditions, what ball would you recommend, uh, in, in high wind conditions when my normal ball is a pro V one? Okay. So we could take more than another, we can take one more question from this too. Cause this is, it's an important question. A lot of people want to shift ball. Don't shift balls. Do not change the golf ball that you're playing based on the wind. Um, it's, it's not going to do you any good because when it gets really, really windy, you're going to miss even more greens. And when you miss more greens, you need more touch. And if you switch the ball that you're playing, you're going to lose touch. And all of a sudden, you're going to miss greens and you're not going to get it up and down. So you're going to compound the, the problem. And so I would, what I would say is just understand how to flight golf balls down a little bit. Understand um, how, how fast the wind is blowing and how it affects your golf ball as far as you know curve and distance. And, and I would continue to play pro v1 which is what you're playing so i love that but i would continue to to play the golf ball that you uh that you play in in normal conditions don't go changing that okay all right let's get one more okay this one from mickey and it was in reference to your answer on jeff's question uh which was about moving toward the ball is it uh, because of your shoulder tilt wouldn't the lead shoulder go down and back um the backswing yeah it, it is it it it's going to go down and back no question about it and in fact, what I think a lot of people do, and let's go down the line here, what a lot of people do is they don't let it go down and back because when it goes down and back like this, so you go to split screen here, Gibbsy. So if we go split, if I go down and back, you can see the head kind of shift back that way. That's because that shoulder is going down and back, right? But what a lot of people do is that when they go to go reach that forward ball position, that's when they let their head go forward or trail shoulder forward and then many let the trail shoulder go up and they let the trail shoulder go up because they start going this way they start they start bowing over their lead foot and when they bow over their lead foot now the trail shoulder is going up and the shoulders get level and now what we get here is we get a pull across and it creates a problem so the answer to the question is yeah no question i i need that shoulder to go down and i need it to go back but it will because the second you go like this if I just take my hip and go like that, keep your head or try to feel like your head is staying right where it is, and I just bump that lead shoulder, this, I mean, the bump the lead hip, this trail shoulder is going to go down. So this goes like that, and it goes down just like that. What, so if, you don't, what about the uh, the lead shoulder? He said because the shoulder tilt, wouldn't the lead shoulder go down and back? No, no. Lead shoulder is going to go up. It will go back, but it will go up because what you get is, and this is easy to show this way. So imagine I've got a T-bar right here, right? Let's flip this around. So this is the lead shoulder. Now, when I take this bar and I go like this, so imagine this is my head's right up here like this. My hips are right here. When I take this and I move this forward, see how that moves forward? I still have a T, but this thing right here goes back. 
And if this goes down, this has to go up. It's a seesaw. So this goes like that. This goes down. This goes up. But both of them go back. They're both going back because this goes back. So when this tilts and that goes that way, both go back, but this goes up and this goes down. Okay? Okay. So now I say this to you. Thank you all so much for watching us. And please, we're, you guys are doing such a good job. We are growing this YouTube channel. And we're getting more and more people to watch. And we're helping more and more people play better golf. And we do that because you get to ask questions just like Jeff asked or like everybody asked, right? We get to, we get to clear up some things that maybe allow you to kind of play a little bit better. We start to understand hip depth. And, and we start to understand trail elbow. And we understand uh, the stuff that goes on in the with the video cameras. We start to understand all this stuff and we get better. So please tell your friends, join us here on YouTube. We're doing it every Thursday. We're, we're kind of, we've, because of schedules and things, we've been pretty much 12 o'clock East coast. Sometimes we jump to one o'clock, but then it gives you a chance to go back and watch it again. Maybe you missed something. Maybe you weren't sure about something. Maybe you had to leave early and you had to go do something at work. You get to come back, tell people about what we're doing over here. And you guys are doing a great job growing this, growing this, uh, channel. We want to keep going. Our goal is to get to a hundred thousand and every day we see, we, we keep growing. So we're growing by a couple hundred, uh, every, every week. So you guys are doing a great job, but our goal is to get to a hundred thousand. So make sure you tell some people and tell them, Hey, tell let's grow this and grow this. The more you do this, the better it is for all of us. Cause we start bringing you instructional information that you get to hang on to for an extended period of time. And you get to interact with us. So we appreciate that. Okay. So please do that. Quick reminders, the blessed poker chips, we've got them. Make sure you, you get involved with that. They're six bucks. Very easy. We also have uh, the, the hats, which are, are right here. We've got them in a bunch of different colors. That right there. Yeah. Get right in there. Look at that. Be part of the community, a new breed of golf. We also have the let's do this putter covers. That's the mallet. You can see the let's do this right there. And then that's autographed on the side right there, just like that. And then of course we have, um, we have my, my two friends, my two friends who work so hard at doing all this stuff, Greg, and of course, Gibbsy, and there's no fives at all. No, uh, we're done with, oh we're gosh. done with that for the what day. What is going on? What's going on around here? I never know what's going on around here. Anyway, we're here every week trying to help you play better golf. We're also on Sirius XM on a new breed of golf, which we will be there, uh, tomorrow at 8 a.m. So join us there and also too uh, on CBS Sports. Proud to be a part of the CBS Sports golf team. And every, uh, not every, but most weekends, we have a show, half an hour show that leads into um, the coverage on the PGA Tour, the Wells Fargo this week. We've got a really cool special on Sunday. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got Mike Thomas, PGA professional, the father of, of Justin Thomas will be joining us. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on with with Justin, also too, what the PGA of America means to uh, to Mike. We're going to talk a little bit about Justin Thomas, and I'm going to give you some instructional stuff that's going to help you play better golf. So make sure you join us. That's 2.30 on Sunday. So that's what I got. Join us tomorrow, 8 a.m. on SiriusXM. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm Michael Breed. We'll see you next week. I'll talk to you tomorrow.